We have five great stories to share with you today. First, Dan Ives of Wedbush Securities is out saying that the stage is set for tech stocks to move 10% higher into the year and another 20% in 2025. We're now in a tech bull market led by the AI revolution. Second, we've got video of the CEO of Rivian, RJ's Garinj, talking about how Tesla's supercharger network is the best charging network out there with uptime of 99.97%. He also praised Tesla as a great partner for them. I wonder if this hints at a future FSE licensing deal. Third, Chinese electric vehicle maker NIO is now raising $460 million in a bid to not run out of cash. Fourth, Volkswagen has cut its annual sales and delivery outlooks for the second time in less than three months. Fifth, not to be outdone, Stellantis, the maker of Chrysler, Dodge, and Jeep announced profit warnings, and as expected, their stocks dropped. So today we've got Jeff Lutz. He's an ex-supply chain C-level executive at several Fortune 100 companies like Google, Lenovo, and Motorola. He's currently running his own consulting firm. Thank you, Jeff. Hey, Herbert. Great to be with you. A lot of stuff going on. I love to talk to you specifically when uh, when we're talking about other car companies. You are very good about um, explaining what's going on with the auto market, the used car market, the financing. And now, you know, we've been following every story about uh, many of these legacy auto that are struggling. Um, in the meantime, you know, they're struggling, but... It looks like the stock market's doing not so bad. Here's Dan Ives of Wedbush Securities. He's predicting that the tech stocks are going to move 10% higher into the year end, another 20% in 2025. It's a tech bull market just hitting its next phase, led by the AI revolution. We believe the overall AI infrastructure market opportunity could grow 10x from today through 2027. And of course, Tesla is one of those, if not one of the leaders in those space. Uh, do you think this is too bullish? And what do you think this impact to Tesla might be? No. And and when, when I see people trying to call a top on uh, AI infrastructure, it it's I don't I don't get it. Uh, we haven't even scratched the surface. If you if you look at what you can do today with a copilot from Microsoft or what you know the kind of accuracy and, and output you're getting from some of these language models and, and what you can actually get. You know, some things are extremely useful. Some things are just wrong. Some things you just, they don't have access or capability for real-time information. A lot of it is compute constrained. And it, we're, we're just, we're just scratching the surface of what's possible. And, you know, there's a, a, a multi, at least on the infrastructure side, there's a multi-year trajectory. And by the way, I think if you're a device company, when I say a device company, you're building a product that goes into the hands or maybe even into the garage of consumers. If you're not a leader on the infrastructure side, I, I, I think you're going to have, I think you're going to struggle. You're not going, you're not going to be, you know, a top, you know, device maker. If you don't have the, the chops on the infrastructure side, again, to do the training and to, and to do kind of everything on the back end and control that and really control the whole experience for the consumer. I know some of these big AI infrastructure players are going to be able to, you know, they're going to sell this capability and it's going to be out there. But I think the best experiences are going to be when you have these players that can control the the network infrastructure side of it. So this is think of all these GPU clusters and think of all the infrastructure around that all the way down to the device level. And that's what you see Tesla building. Now they may be working with with partners again on the infrastructure side, but you know, in, in the background, they're obviously working on their own solution, but they have their own edge device solution. So I, I, I agree with Dan's assessment. I think we're just scratching the surface. It may be bumpy in certain areas, but in general, you know, the trajectory is, is up and to the right. You know, no one, you know, for the next, I mean, couple of years, no one sees this slowing down. And you, when they talk to all the major hyperscalers, the metas, the alphabets of the world, Amazons, everybody's basically on the side of like, I'd rather overcall this than undercall it. The cost of undercalling it would be, you know, catastrophic to your company. And I think some of that's going to translate down into the auto world here very soon. Okay. Well, tell me quickly, because you didn't, how is this going to impact Tesla? You talked about AI, the tech boom is going to happen. What about Tesla? Where does it fit in? Uh, I, I think as people start seeing, you know, these vehicles going through parking lots and picking people up. I think lights are starting mm -hmm. to turn on for people. More analysts are now, are now, you know, downloading 12.5 and trying in their vehicle. 
by the way, maybe they have a mixed experience. Maybe it's not perfect. That's fine. The fact that more of them are doing this tells mm -hmm. you that Tesla is getting closer and there's more eyeballs on this. And I think the other thing that it means for Tesla is everybody's looking, who's buying all this compute? Who's, who, like, who's mm -hmm. aggregating all this compute? Who are the big players in this? And now Tesla with XAI, basically, you know, Elon Inc. are, you know, up, I think in the top three now in terms of, of buying compute. So I think what it means for Tesla, so we know what Tesla is working on in terms of their vehicles. And we know why Tesla is procuring all this compute. By the way, this Texas supercluster hasn't even played into the performance we're seeing on our vehicles today. So wait till that comes online and what that can do. And then we see what they're doing with, with, with XAI. So I think for Tesla, we're going to see greater performance in our vehicles, more capability. We're going to see us going from FSD, you know, getting FSD supervised out broadly and more subscribers and more regions on it broadly. And then the path to unsupervised, which I actually think starts with smart summon and starts with some of this capability uh, that Tesla trains for, for unsupervised. And then eventually they robot. So I think we're right now, we're in this, call it 12 month window of incredible transition for the company. And it starts with their AI assets. Love it. Great answer, by the way. Great points. Um, I, I agree with you, of course. I think if this is it, that we're starting to see Tesla being seen as an AI company. So while Tesla's not only doing great in AI, they're also being doing great in electric vehicles and their auto business. Let's talk about the other automakers and what they're doing. First, Rivian. So we got Rivian here. The CEO was interviewed, RJ Scaringe. He talked about how great Tesla Supercharger Network is. It's the number one charging network. Very high density, record high average uptime in nine uptime of 99.97%. And he says Tesla has been a great partner for us. Uh, let's listen to what he says. There's one great network at scale today, which is Tesla's network. And if if you're to measure the, the quality of a network by uh, two things, I'd say it's it's density of chargers and then the uptime, meaning like how often they work. And for anybody that has an electric vehicle that's used some of the other networks, one of the most frustrating things in the world is you're on a road trip, you pull into a charger. You don't have a lot of time, you plug it in and the charger's broken. Mm -hmm. So our network today, which is uh, amazingly and uh, indicatively to my point, uh, it's the fourth largest network in the United States. We're just getting started building right. it. Uh, us and Tesla are the only two networks that have uh, uptime that's close to 100%. Tesla's like 99% okay. or 98.5%. So the reason I say all that is we put an agreement together with Tesla that allows us to access their network. A number of other manufacturers have done this as well. And our network, we're about to open up. So today it's Rivian only. I'm really excited to open it up so that there are two great networks being built in the United States. We hope more. I truly hope lots of investment starts to flow and we see other people invest to build out this net these networks. But in my view, there needs to be more than two high quality sure. sources of energy for, for driving longer distances. Uh, but, but when but it comes to happened. when it comes to making that decision, do you regret it? I mean, do you no, feel no. like do you feel like Elon or Tesla sort of may presented you with no. a false bill of goods? Look, I, I, there, we wish the the adapter ramp up was faster. There's Tesla adapters. There's also we've independently developed uh, something that's ramping. The supply chains are complex. Ramps yeah. up, ramp up. This is not a some intentional slowing of the ramp of that supply chain. Uh, okay. Tesla has been a great partner to us on this. And we've um, particularly, they, you think about all the noise that happens and, and you maybe imagine that there's some tension that exists mm. between top of house between these two companies. That's not the case. But more than that, at a working level, yeah, the teams work great. I mean, well, engineers work really well with engineers. So our engineers work close with the Tesla uh, supercharger team to make right. sure that the, there's a beautiful software integration. I had a customer come to me and he's like, I couldn't believe I pulled in a Tesla station, I plugged in my Rivian, and it just worked. Yeah. And <laughs> like behind the scenes, of course, we made sure all the credit card information between our account was shared with Tesla, but it was like so seamless that it mm. was a zero thought had to go into it. And that's because our engineers work really well with the Tesla engineers. All right. Well, that was kind of a weird question because there's only I looked it up right as he was talking. There's only four hundred DC fast chargers at sixty seven locations. <laughs> so it's like do you wish that you four. didn't partner with Tesla? It's like uh, he had to partner with Tesla. But anyways, he he said a few good things about Tesla, of course. You know, Supercharger Network is a partnership. Uh, thoughts about potentially increasing that? Did you get a hint that he might actually partner with Tesla for more things than just superchargers? Well, this isn't going to be a... 
this is at some point this isn't going to be a question of like what feels right it's going to be more of like what what's ex existential for survival and when teslas are driving themselves around and and have all this capability in your car does i mean I'll, I'll tell you right now i like i mean i think rivian makes a beautiful looking vehicle i think their build quality is good i think um i i like i like the company and i, I mean the thing that prevents me from buying a Rivian R1S is it doesn't have FSD. And I, I, I will, I just, in my experience now, knowing where FSD is today, I wouldn't buy another vehicle unless it has that capability, whether it's a $30,000 vehicle or, or much higher, I, I wouldn't want to buy that vehicle unless it has the capability to, to drive itself uh, with FSD. So I think that is a big component. I don't know. It's, it's not going to be a question of, do they feel it's right or not? I think it's going to come down to, you know, it's going to be existential to their survival that they're, they're going to need it. And again, there's a, there's a big corollary here. The capital requirements to do your own supercharging network and to do that huge investment and then to not have, they don't have a lot of vehicles on the road. I mean, they're doing well. They're doing well in sales relative to everyone else. But from a utilization perspective, if they were to... In, invest dollars into their own supercharger network and only have it be used for Rivians, that would be a highly, highly underutilized network, which would be just a huge cash burn for them. That's the wrong thing for a startup company that's that's basically pre-gross margins and, and not EBIT positive. So the best thing for them in that situation is to, is to leverage and buy capacity from an existing player who has all the has a huge installation slots, Tesla, and and basically buy and borrow that capacity. That's the best thing for a company to do from a cash perspective. I'm sure they've made it pretty much cash neutral for or or you know or even you know cash neutral for Rivian to deal with it, and it helps Tesla on the on the uh, on the utilization side as well. So why am I drawing this example? The same thing I believe is going to happen for full self driving. The cost and the assets and the R and D burn involved in doing your own program, doing setting up your own network infrastructure versus saying, okay, Tesla has done all this training. They have all this capability. They have the lowest cost uh, total uh, for, for the vehicle in terms of the hardware that needs to go in. You're sitting around with your board. You're sitting around with your management team. And here's my trajectory over the next three years. And here's where we think Tesla is going to be over three years. We can buy it for them for this cost per vehicle for, you know, this is the cost per slot. This is the ongoing recurring cost we pay to Tesla, or we can burn this much R and D over that same amount at the same time period. It'll cost us this much in network infrastructure because we're a smaller player. It'll cost us this much per vehicle because we don't have, we're a small player relative in vehicles as well. So the data and facts are going to point to that being, you know, I, I think being the conclusion, the question is, is when do they pull the trigger? Great. Next question. Next story here. This car here is a Neo. Fantastic looking cars, just like the, like you said with the Rivians. Fantastic looking cars. I actually really do like them. I want them to succeed. Same with Neo, but they're struggling. And both Rivian and Neo, same thing. They're needing to raise money because their cash flow management is not that great. And you are somebody again running big corporations, management of fa uh, factories, and you're careful. You need to be careful about the cost the build and so forth. That's part of your supply chain expertise. So this is a Neo and it uh, looks great. I mean, they, they really are one of the pure play electric vehicle companies in China that have built a decent car. Problem is they're running out of money. So they just announced another $460 million capital raise. AJ at ALOJOH, great follow on X. He said that he predicted Neo would raise more capital before year end in December. In December 2023, he was already saying that they'll need to do this based on cash flow analysis. He also predicted accurately Neo's prior capital raises. So he's been following this. He produces these kinds of charts. And at that time when he did this, this is what he was saying that at some point, if you follow what's going on with their Cash flow. Cash flow is the most one of the most important things. Free cash flow is something that Elon says is one of the most important uh, metrics to follow. So now the now announced capital raise was also likely the reason why Neo hasn't provided 
first half 2024 cash flows yet <laughs> and they needed to show hey we're gonna be okay so this is what they did uh thoughts on you know raising money like this at least at least these guys were able to get something yeah everybody thinks that everybody that starts up a, a car company in china is immediately going to crush and kill everybody else that tries to build a car in the world and that's just not the case a lot of the players in china are either going out of business or they're they're in they're having serious problems regardless of the fact that there's all these natural resources locally regardless of the fact that they've spent you know china spent over a decade in building up the supply chain for you know the major components copper and so forth and of course all the the minerals and supply chain for for battery production despite all that if you still you know you still design a vehicle you know the right unit economics or something where you scale it, it becomes contribution margin positive, you're going to run into these situations. And so, I, I mean, I haven't studied each of their vehicles very closely, but if they've got too many models, if they're spreading, you know, spreading their supply chain too thin, and they're just not getting a lot of, you know, great leverage per part number, you know, in their supply chain, or they're just, they've got too much from a value per dollar perspective, uh, they've got too much in their bill of material, you know, they're going to run in these problems, whether regardless if you're building your car in China or or not. So I think when you look at these capital raises, you have to realize remember Tesla, you know, for, you know, for greater than a decade was doing capital raises as well. And, and Tesla grew up in a zero interest rate environment. This is a tough environment. You know, if Tesla were going through its first 10 years over the last couple of years, it would have been a lot more difficult than what Tesla actually experienced, not taking anything away from Tesla. I'm just saying the macro environment is very difficult. Take the global macro and now take China macro where you've had this slowdown, you've had these issues occurring. And I think that's why they're struggling. So we'll see how this plays out for them. So thank you for that. Yes, of course, cash flow is critical and they need to raise money. The problem is um, only Tesla. You can watch it happen and fall into cash flow, and then they were able to solve the problem, and then they skyrocket up in terms of cash flow generation from car sales. So far, every single car company, they are just continuing to lose, including Neo. So that's good that they raise money. Uh, we want them to survive. So one of the other next topic we're going to talk about is these legacy autos that continue to have story after story of how they're doing poorly. Sometimes it feels like we're reporting the same story because... It's happening yet again. Here's Volkswagen one more time coming out and they need to cut. They're cutting their annual sales and delivery outlooks again in less than three months. They came out for the second time, Jeff. I mean, like what's going on here? Why couldn't they just announce that at the first some new information came? Like why would they just announce it in less than three months, Jeff? Well, their their ability to forecast is obviously challenged. You've got, you've got, um, troubling macro you've got at least local in germany and in parts of the eu you've got uh, incentives coming off and i think it's just been difficult for them you know they put these long range forecasts in sometimes a year in advance to to drive capital and to drive long lead items within the supply base and then you've got these changes in incentive structures and so forth not making excuses you know in general if you don't have the right product and if you don't have the right cost structure in your company you're going to be issuing these warnings. That's one of the reasons you see Tesla and maybe some other companies, you know, really getting you know, like things aren't going so bad. Why are they doing these massive reductions or what's, what are they trying to do? What are they trying to get in front of Tesla did one in 2022 and they did one, you know, in the early part of this year, and they're trying to get ahead of these slowdowns in situations like this. And in these other auto companies, they don't have, the big uh, AI infrastructure spend that you see Tesla doing as well with their with their cash. So it's not only that they're actually struggling to build and ship cars and be profitable and to be able to throw off cash in their business. They're not actually doing the forward investment they need to be doing to get to a real you know autonomy solution that can scale both in volume and scale from a cost structure perspective. And I think that's the bigger red X for these companies, they have to decide, you know, if they're going to restructure, if they're going to go to the capital markets and ask for money, if you're giving them money, like we well, have to think to yourself, like, Hey, what have they done the last 12 months? Well, they have burned it and they've, you know, it's, it's been horrible. Well, what are you going to do differently in the next 12 months? So the money mm -hmm. I give you is going to be used more efficiently. And I think that's some of the questions that should be asked. But yeah, Volkswagen, you know, 
they've worn. Here's the thing. We've been talking about it on your show all year. The canary in the coal mine is looking at their, their inventory positions. And if you look at their inventory positions, I know we're going to talk about Stellantis for, for example, and you can see these patterns of them, you know, getting a bunch of cars in the channel, stuffing the channel. And then they have these, these super long, or sorry, these super long supply chains. And then they have the super high inventory levels. That's a recipe for closing factories, furloughing workers, layoffs, and then profit warnings. And they're going to be coming in succession. And if you've watched, you know, this show and this channel, we've talked about it at multiple points this year. In fact, we highlighted Stellantis, which I think we're going to talk about here soon. Let's continue back to Volkswagen. This is what they reported. So on Friday, they said it's now forecasting a profit margin of roughly 5.6% for the year. It's going to be down from its previous target of 6.5 to 7%. The forecast also falls below a 6.5% forecast from the London, London Stock Exchange Group. The automaker is now predicting sales to fall by 0.7% to 320 billion euros instead of 356, or that's around 356 billion dollars US dollars. After initially expecting to see sales increase by as much as 5%, they definitely didn't get what they were hoping for. They reduced their global de delivery outlook to 9 million after delivering 9.24 last year. And then they were predicting an increase of 3%. Uh, so it cut the forecast in light of challenging market environment developments that have fallen short of original expectations. Um, so they are, along with Volkswagen, even BMW and Mercedes have also cut recent forecasts. Again, they're all pointing to the weakening demand for the brands in China. They basically are going to get, they're kicked out of there at this point. They're just so low in numbers. They're not able to compete. The outlook shift also comes as Volkswagen has been in negotiation with IG Metal, the union, um, about wages and job predictions. So there's kind of, they're getting hit on both sides. They can't cut. As, yeah. as, as much as they want to. Um, here's another big story to talk about is why did these automakers, um, legacy automakers, they're not doing well in China because the surprising thing is they actually, they all partnered with a Chinese joint venture and the Chinese are building those cars for them. And yet, the, I guess the consumer's just not liking their brand. And so it's, uh, it's game over for them in China. Yeah, they want their own brand and, or they want, something that's global, ubiquitous, and trusted. And, uh, you know, and Tesla is doing well there right now. You know, here's the here's the other thing is we don't know how conservative... So when you have these companies that do these successive warnings where they warn and they warn again, w w there's a certain, you know, approach you can take if you're <clears throat> in the management team is which is, you know, do you rip the Band-Aid once? And do you look out and you say, look, I think this is as bad as it's going to get. Here's a number, put it out there. I don't want to come back to this again and redo it. Or are you just, are you overly optimistic and saying, well, look, I, I just want to cut it a little bit. And then, and then maybe we'll, we'll, we'll see where the market is, you know, in the fourth quarter, we don't know what we're dealing with in terms of this management team. If this was a bandaid rip, it looks like, you know, with multiple warnings, and I think we're going to see this with Stellantis too, that they're not just, they're not looking at it and saying, look, this is going to be bad. And and really just letting the public know, like, this is going to be really troubling over the next, you know, call it 12 to 18 months. And here's our plan to right the ship. So my point is, is we could be coming back here in three months again. There could be additional uh, additional warnings coming. We don't know how conservative they are. It looks like, you know, with multiple successive warnings like this, that they're just taking this in, in, small, in small steps. The other thing is we don't know you know, not to use a pun, but what's going on under the hood? What's going on with receivables? What's going on with supplier liability? Is that building up? If you if you gave some wonderful looking long range forecast for the 9.24 million vehicles, and now you're at nine, someone else is eating, you know, eating that. And so the question is, is you know, what's going on under the hood? It's usually far worse. Um, when you look upstream and the other companies try to internally figure it out. Finally, I'll say is we just watched a video on Rivian and, and what they're doing in their, in their Tesla supercharging partnership. The other partnership they have, the big one that was touted earlier this year is with Volkswagen. So, you know, Volkswagen is under this much stress in their primary business. You have to wonder, you know, is this partnership, you know, under threat as well? And remember this, 
this partnership was in multiple stages, multiple different milestones had to be met. So it wasn't $5 million, you know, being plopped into, into Rivian's lap. It was over multiple stages. You just wonder how, what kind of risk level that's at now, given Volkswagen struggling in their, in their main business. This story is about Volkswagen, but we also said that Mercedes and BMW also cut their sales forecast. Now you got Stellantis and Aston Market, Martin also uh, announcing profit warnings, again, because of the China woes. Stellantis and Aston Martin, their shares have dropped. Stellantis is Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Maserati, lower than expected sales across most regions in the second half of the year. So now they're penciling in an adjusted operating income margin between 5.5 to 7% for the full year 2024, instead, which is not what they had given the outlook of double digit margins. Aston Martin, Martin, I don't know why I keep saying Aston Martin, uh, you know, they also flag cuts in its profit margin and production target for the year. Stellantis, um, you know, their, their stock has fallen big time because of this. People are starting to realize, you know, at this point, um, bolstered competition from China. They're just not doing well. And um, this is just a repeat of everything we just said. Yeah, they're blaming the uh, co competitive dynamics in China. They're blaming the um, this the situation and environment. What do you think, Jeff? Well, Stellantis in the U.S. had 150 to 200 days of vehicle inventory. And automakers target about 50 days. So you're looking at three to four times the inventory level. So just do it. Just do it in time. They had, you know, over a half years of inventory and dealers are looking at Solanta saying, what are you doing? What are you doing to us? You're, you're killing us. We have to discount our product. We need your help to discount products. So there's price protection going back and forth. Remember when OEM ship product and move it out of their four wall, they move it into dealer inventory and that's in channel that, you know, that while they're not, it's not on their books to say from an auto OEM perspective. It is because if that channel, if that channel is not moving, their factory should not be building more product and putting it in. So Slantis was accused of, of literally stuffing the channels and not listening to dealers, especially I think in the second quarter of this year. So I, I just go back to it again, looking at the inventory levels, if there's no corrective action, being taken by these companies or there's nothing on the horizon that would tell you like why these things are being consumed inventory levels are a great way to, to to forecast some of this happening and you have to be adept at how to read inventory and i see some of these things on x and people are trying to look at these whatever these um you know pop-up inventory trackers on tesla and they're like look that's the highest inventory ever well wait a minute they're trying to actually ship more mm -hmm. cars than they ever had before. So you have to understand how to read these things and what inventory looks like in the beginning of a quarter versus the end of the quarter in different stages. So the inventory to me was the big signal on, on Stellantis. Um, they have now their, their board has basically said, Hey, we're, we're looking for a new CEO of the company. So they've, they've basically said they're not going to re up the contract of the existing CEO. So this is, this is a pretty dire situation for them. And again, I think I think there's more to come. I think this is just the beginning. Yeah, thank you for that, Jeff. Again, I, I think this is why people need to be following you, watching you, because you have ahead of time, you always say, look, here's a red, what they call it, canary in the gold mine. Look what's going on red in flag, yeah. because Red flag, because when that happens, guess what? We then do a show three months later, reporting on our news, actual financial impact to the company. It's, it's happened time and time again, where you're already predicting what's going to happen. Here's remember, we were just talking about cash flow in Neo and they need to raise flash raise cash. Here's what happened to Stellantis. So they had to lower the projections for free cash flow. Look at this. It's now to minus 5 billion euros to minus 10 billion euros. When they initially gave guidance that the cash flow was going to be positive. That's like a massive, massive, like flip in their cash flow. They're not doing something right here at all. So um yeah, there yeah. are huge issues across the board. And, 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 and nobody knows, you know, and nobody this is from operations. Nobody knows what what's the Stellantis plan for aut autonomy, right? What where, where do they have to invest for that? 
Um, the other, the other Stellantis, the famous Stellantis problem I see besides the high inventory is just the number mm -hmm. of models. And they believe mm -hmm. they have this, they have this approach of just more models, more tiers, right. more sales. And when you run into slowdown situations like this, this is when it becomes a disaster because then you, you have the channel inventory build up. It's across so many different models and then your forecast inaccuracies become greater mm -hmm. with your supply chain. So then you're, you're starting and stopping things. You're, they're going to have, when they, when they eventually hopefully try to ramp up again in the future, we'll see. Um, they're going to have trouble getting supply across all these different models. It's, it's, uh, it's a really bad situation to try to get the scale across so many different models. And, and when you run into these situations like they're in right now, it's a, it's a tough, when you're trying to put the brakes on something, you have to put the brakes on 30 or 40 different things. It's a very complex thing to do. And you run in, you'll run into cash flow situations like this. And again, nobody knows how they're investing for the future in terms of real, honestly, EV, but, but, but mainly uh, what they're doing for autonomy. Oh yeah. I think, they, I think they're in trouble. Ice is down, EV's down. They're not be able to do that. And then they're not going to be talking about autonomy. And by the way, you, the other thing, yeah. just the U S department of energy, I love the work that they're doing across all these different clean energy investments. I do not like their approach to how they're allocating both grants and loans mm. to the U S automakers because you can see how inefficient yeah. Stellantis is in their normal operation. So why would you throw more good money after this operation, look at their ROIC, return on invested capital, yeah. and look what a company like Tesla, for, for example, it just, it's a really poor use of taxpayer money. Uh, yeah, it's a bailout. That's a bailout. They can't let them fall. And so they're in it without calling it a bailout at this point. Um, meantime, again, I just, it's just the way the reports are coming. The Tesla production delivery numbers uh, is going to be reported Wednesday. So when we uh, publish this, it'll be Tuesday. This will be on Wednesday. You will see the actual production delivery numbers for Tesla, and they should be good. The most of Wall Street reports indicate sales are up from the same time a year ago. Wall Street expects 460,000 deliveries, up 6% compared with the third quarter of 2023. And by the way, that 460 is low. Many of us are saying 470 and higher. What's your target, Jeff? Well, I, I'm not a person that that counts vehicles. I do appreciate the work that that people that do that work do. Just what I would keep in mind, and again, from being on the inside of of an operation of a supply chain operation, that there is information that people on the outside just don't have. So, I when I see people put these estimates out, I think it could be plus or minus twenty or thirty thousand vehicles from these mm -hmm. estimates, and and you know, in terms of error that could occur. So just keep that in mind. Just, I just have to go back to really quickly one more thing in the Salantha story. I think two mm. or three weeks ago, Herbert, we were, we were talking about an article where the United Auto Workers were literally about to go on national strike because yeah. Stellantis yeah. wouldn't agree yes. to build another factory and augment and increase the capacity in another factory. And here you have them doing, literally in a split screen, doing profit warnings this is how broke these that these automakers are, starting from the unions all the way to their their roadmaps, mm -hmm. their complexity, their cost structure. Just in one hand, just a couple of weeks ago, they were literally being about to be go on strike because this one side of the labor just says like, you're not opening enough factories quick enough. And here they're saying, hey, we have way too much capacity, we have way too much inventory. Here's a profit warning. I just it's amazing to me. Um, but anyway, back to uh, the Tesla again. These estimates could be plus or minus twenty, thirty thousand, in my opinion. I think it should be strong. I think the financing programs are helpful. I think they're table stakes right now in this global macro uh, rate mm -hmm. environment, and uh, and I think Tesla's in a good position. Again, the only other I, I I see the 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 bear side of the argument of like, well, look at they're extending all the the uh, the financing agreements. There must be issues with demand. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, the consumer is under pressure. There, there will be issues with demand with every car maker. To me, this is table stakes. The only other option is to not have the financing programs, not take the hit on gross margins there, but then take the hit on gross margins from underutilizing your factories and slowing them down. So I think if you're Tesla and you know you've got these new lower cost vehicles on the horizon 
and you know rates are coming down, this is the move you do. If you're another company and you don't have that portfolio, you don't know if you're going to produce the next vehicles with better gross margins and lower costs for consumers. Maybe there is a different choice. Maybe you do you, you do just slow down and try to hunker down. But I think Tesla is playing the wind because they have that portfolio on the horizon and no rates are coming down. This, the, this right. is the right move for them. Gotcha. I love it. Yeah, that was a good commentary because it's not necessarily, yeah, yes, uh, the consumer is struggling, number one. So just keep that in mind. But two, Tesla is trying to continue having the 80%, all the factories at least 80% capacity. They're going to increase that. Um, that's why they're doing the incentives and so forth. Meanwhile, you and I reported just recently that what 30% of all the factories in Europe are 50% or less in capacity. And so those guys are about to go and cancel those factories. And so Tesla is able to keep it at 80%. Let's keep it at, at least 80%. Let's keep going that route. Thank you so much, Jeff. I love yep. it. I'm learning so much. I really do appreciate um, how much uh, you, you educate all of us. Follow Jeff on his X account at the Jeff Lutz. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Herbert. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.